Hello. In this video, we build on our previous video and we talk about how to take your basic functions and move them up and down, left and right, and stretch them and shrink them before flipping them over different axes. So this is going to be a whole gymnastics of functions today. But before you get started, make sure you know those basic graphs. Here we go. So to begin, in this box on the right side of the screen, there's a lot of content there. But the main thing you want to look for is what is happening to my function? What happened to my beautiful function? For example, if you have the function y equals x squared plus 2, the first thing you should be thinking of, that's a parabola, right? Because its main basic pattern is take your input and square it, right? So if you have something like y equals x squared, that's where you'd actually want to think, what is the graph? It's a parabola. OK, what does this plus 2 business mean? That's the new part for today. Well, that's actually one of our more basic transformations. And it's in this first box right here on the top of your, your screen here. And that is a vertical shift. You're shifting the graph up two units. The reason is, I won't give you the reason for all of them, but the reason is you're adding two units to all of your outputs, right? So if your output, let's say you input a 1 and you squared it, you get 1. Rather than that being your output, you've now added 2 to it. So now your y value, instead of a 1, is a 3. So in other words, if you notice that you have added or subtracted a constant at the end of your basic function, that really means that in each of your points that you've memorized, you're going to take those y values and you're going to add the number. If it's positive, it's going up. And if it's negative, it's going down to, your, to your, each of your y values. So that's the easiest type of transformation. But we typically do that toward the end when we have lots of transformations. So this is an example of shifting your graph vertically up two units. So it's all about pattern recognition. The ones that are more complicated for students are typically ones, for example, where, let me grab another color for us. Look at our second one here. In this second situation, that's horizontal shifts. And for the horizontal shifts, that's going to look something like y equals x minus 2 in parentheses to the second power. So your main function now is like in a parentheses, OK? But there's some addition or subtraction inside. When that happens, what's really happening is your inputs are being switched around. So instead of an input of 1, now you have shifted your graph to the right two units. Now this is the part that's kind of counterintuitive. This means I shift my graph right two units. Most students would prefer when they see a minus sign to shift to the left, right? But because it's in the parentheses, it will always be counterintuitive. You'll actually notice this if you go to desmos.com or to your graphing calculator or graph by hand. You'll notice that the vertex, which was at 0, 0, by shifting this graph with x minus 2 squared, by shifting it over two units to the right, now instead of at 0, 0, when you input 2, positive 2, 2 minus 2 in parentheses here gives you that 0 output when you square it. And so that is why the negative inside the parentheses, when you're adding or subtracting a number, Subtracting actually looks like you're moving to the right, and adding will look like you're moving to the left. So this is the one that's really tricky for most students. It's the one where the change is happening inside the function's input. We're adding or subtracting a number, but it's counterintuitive. So we actually go to our x values there, and we subtract or we add, but opposite of what we would have thought. OK, the next one that we're going to look at today will be the third one here, which is flipping your graph over one of the axes. So reflecting about the x-axis or the y-axis. This one also can seem counterintuitive. And what you're going to be seeing is, are things like this. Maybe you have the function y equals the square root of x. But now instead of taking that function, which was just your parabola on the side, but half of it, right? Now they're going to say, OK, now you have a negative sign in front of the whole thing. Well, a negative sign in front of the whole thing would change the output sign, wouldn't it? It would take the opposite of your y values. And that's what's happening. If the negative sign is in front, then you're going to take the opposite of each of your y values, aren't you? So this makes this output now down here, and this output now down here. And it flips your graph over the x-axis. So a negative in front of the entire function really changes the signs of your y outputs, which means you're flipping over the x axis. So it's kind of counterintuitive. You change the signs of your y values when you flip over the x axis. You recognize it by noticing a negative in front of the function. But what if that negative sign was inside the function? So instead of the square root of x with a negative in front, we had the square root of negative x. Well, that would mean we're actually flipping it over the, uh, the y axis in that case. So if I had y equals the square root of negative x, the original graph was here, right? 
But now I'm saying I'm switching the signs of my x values. So switching the signs of my x values would mean this graph is now going to look like this. So that would be our new graph here. Okay. So that's the difference here. One is a flip over the y-axis, one is a flip over the x-axis. And knowing the difference is critical. Okay, the last thing we'll be doing today, I know there's lots of stuff on this slide, but the very last thing you'll be, you'll be encountering will be the idea of stretching and shrinking. And we're gonna only do vertical stretches and shrinks. There are such a thing as horizontal compressions. When we get into sine waves and trigonometry, we can stretch and we can shrink. Like in EKG, you can see lots of really fast changes or you can see more spread apart changes. That is a horizontal stretch and shrink. We're not gonna do that in college algebra or in this set of videos, but in future classes we will. Today we're gonna talk about vertical stretching, which really means if you notice that there is a number, a constant, which is multiplied in front of the entire function, so kind of like the sign in front of the entire function changing, that's telling you that you're multiplying your outputs by that number. So you're really taking that number and you're multiplying all of your y values by that number. So for example, I'll write it up here if you can see it, yeah, y equals two times x to the third power. So originally, the graph of x to the third power might have looked something like this snake, right? y equals x cubed. But if I now multiply all of my y values by 2, it'll be kind of hard to show you here, but instead of an output of 1 here, you're now going to have an output of 2. So it's growing faster. And so this snake has been stretched out. It's kind of hard to tell you in that little space. We'll do better ones, I promise. But the idea is you're stretching it out vertically or you're shrinking it by multiplying by a number less than 1. So if you multiply by half, for example, that means that each of those y values got cut in half. So it's actually closer to the x-axis. Okay, so again, before you go into the examples with me, it's imperative that you've memorized the seven basic graphs from our previous uh, section of videos. Um, and once you're ready to, to remember those graphs and the key points, then you're ready to play with me. So let's get started, if you're ready, with our examples here. First example says, sketch using transformations f of x equals negative in front, then parentheses, x plus 1, close parentheses, to the second power. Show at least three key points being transformed. And again, I provided you with the links in the, in the online notes um, that allow you to actually see the graph in desmos.com so you can see how it's uh, moving from one to the next. So you might want to check that out. Okay, so let's see how this works. The first thing we want to know is what graph are we starting with, right? This was something squared. So the original graph was y equals x squared, the parabola, right? So the basic graph that I want to you want to have in your mind is something like this, right? A parabola opening up, full parabola. Now that parabola had three key points, and they were your three key points originally. For y equals x squared, they were negative 1, positive 1, right? They were 0, 0, and they were positive 1, positive 1. I'm not making them up. I'm simply inputting x and getting y, right? So that is the three, those are the three key points that we had for a parabola y equals x squared. Okay, so now that we remember that, let's take a look at the transformations that they're giving you. The first transformation I see is inside the function. Just like order of operations, where do you begin? Inside the parentheses, right? So basically that's what we're doing. We're going inside out. So we look at the inside and we have addition in the parentheses. That means that we shift the graph left or right. It's a horizontal shift. Feel free to look back at the notes from the previous slide. This is shifting the graph to the left, because it's counterintuitive, right? To the left, one unit. So when we're talking about the graph of y equals parentheses x plus 1 squared, we're shifting it to the left one unit, which means the x values or the y values are changing. That's right, the x values. So if you're shifting the values to the left one unit, wouldn't you be subtracting one from each of your x values? So what are your new key points? Instead of negative one, one, we'd be at negative two, one. Instead of zero, zero, we'd be at negative one, zero. And instead of one, one, we'd be at zero, one. We've simply subtracted one from each x value to shift it to the left one unit. So that was our left shift, left one. Well, there's another transformation working our way inside out. And that second transformation that we're going to look at now is this negative sign in front of the entire thing. And that, again, is going to flip or reflect over one of the axes. Let's think about which axis. 
If it's a negative in front of the entire thing, it's saying take the opposite of your output. It's not affecting the input directly. It's not right next to the x. So if it's taking the opposite of your output, the outputs are your y values. So if your y value was positive, it's now negative, which means you're really flipping over the x axis. But the way we do that to reflect over the x axis, reflect over my x axis, is to change the signs of my y values. So my y values are now going to change from positives to negatives, it looks like. So instead of negative 2, positive 1, I have negative 2, negative 1. Instead of negative 1, 0, well, you can't take the opposite of 0, so that part's still 0. But instead of 0, 1, I have 0, negative 1. And this should now be the graph for the whole equation, negative parentheses, x plus 1 squared. Let's go ahead and put them on our graph and see how it looks. At negative 2, we're supposed to have the output of negative 1. So that would be like down here. At negative 1, we're supposed to have the output of 0. And at 0, we're supposed to have the output of negative 1 again. And it's a parabola, and it looks like it's opening down. And again, feel free to check Desmos to confirm this, but let's make sure it makes sense. You had the original parabola opening up. Then you shifted it to the left one unit. So at this step, if you had graphed it, now it would have looked something like this, right? After shifting it to the left one unit, you flipped it over the x-axis. Hey, that is making sense, isn't it? All right, so these just go step by step following your order of operations. Let's see if you can try another one. Maybe try it on your own. In example two, it says f of x equals two times the absolute value of x minus one. So the first thing you want to ask yourself is, what type of function was I dealing with? Yep, that's right, y equals absolute value of x. What is the shape of that that you memorized from your last video? Yep, that was a V-shape, good job. So that was our V-shape, basically two pieces of lines coming together at the origin. Mine's a little ugly, sorry. And the original key points that you started with were the same as the parabola key points, right? Negative one, the absolute value is one. Zero, its absolute value is zero. And one, its absolute value is one. So it starts off with those same key points for y equals the absolute value of x. But what transformations do we encounter here? Well, the first thing we look for is inside parentheses, but I don't see anything inside those absolute value bars, right? If they were, that's what I would do first. The second thing is multiplication, and I do have something touching my output, right? And it is two. That's called a vertical stretch, right? We talked about that in the last part of our previous slide, two slides ago. So what did that do? It's saying you're going to double your outputs, right? So you take what you had, and then you multiply them by two. So we're going to do our vertical stretch of 2. So that means this is a vertical stretch of 2. We are multiplying the y values by 2. A lot of students at this point ask me, Professor, how do I know if it's x or y? Well, ask yourself what it's doing, right? It's multiplying the outputs, which means it's multiplying the y values. OK, so let's take a look at what our new points would look like. Instead of negative 1, 1, we'd be at negative 1, 2, right? Because that's 1 times 2. 0, 0 is still 0, 0, because if you multiply a 0 by anything, it's still 0. But instead of 1, 1, we're at 1, 2, because 1 times 2 is 2. So this is the graph after having been stretched by a factor of 2. So instead of the basic graph there, now it would be more like this. It's, it's definitely been stretched out, because the input here at 1 is now at 2, right up here. That's basically the idea there. But there's one more transformation we have to talk about. What is it? Yep, it's this guy. At the very end of the equation, we have addition or subtraction. It's like a PEMDAS. That's the last thing we do, right? So if we have negative 1 at the end, what is that really doing? It's saying move your graph up or down. It's a vertical shift. And this is moving it down one unit. So with parentheses, we have to be counterintuitive left and right, right? But with the uh, vertical shift, we don't have to be counterintuitive. It literally is subtracting 1 from your outputs. So down one unit means that each of my y values again is going to be changed by subtraction. So let's do that. Instead of negative 1, 2, I'm at negative 1, 1, because 2 minus 1 is 1. Instead of 0, 0, I'm at 0, negative 1. And instead of 1, 2, I'm at 1, 1, because 2 minus 1 is 1. So let's see where we are. We're at negative 1 with an output of 1. We're at 0 with an output of negative 1. And we're at positive 1 with an output of 1. And what's the shape of the graph? 
right V-shaped. So let me get another color you can see better here. How about blue? So we take those three points that we just got here. This is the graph of y equals 2 times the absolute value of x minus 1. This is those points here. And we make our V-shaped graph that goes through those points carefully. It shouldn't be curvy, so I apologize if mine looks curvy. So it's a graph that's been stretched by a factor of 2 and then shifted down one unit. So that should make some sense. Got a couple more examples. Let's see how you're tracking with me. In example 3, same instructions. This time we have y equals the square root of x plus 1 plus 1. Okay, so when we're looking at this again, first things first, what type of function did we have? Well, it's a square root function, isn't it? y equals your square root of x. What type of shape was that? That's right, the parabola on its side, right? With three key points. And what were they again? Yep, that's right. Input 0, you get the square root of 0, which is 0. Input 1, the square root of 1 is 1. Input 2, it's irrational. How about a perfect square like 4? Square root of 4 is 2. So yeah, those are the three easiest points. If you want to input 9, you'd get 3. Input 16, you'd get 4, etc. But you get three basic points there. Okay. That's our graph, y equals square root of x. Now, what type of transformations do we have here? Good. We notice that inside the square root, that's like in parentheses, right, we have addition. And what does addition inside mean? Move your graph left or right? Good, left. We're going left one unit, like we did earlier. So if I'm going left one unit, oopsies. If you're going left one unit, which values am I changing, x or y? Good, changing my x. So 0, 1, and 4 are now being subtracted, since it's going left one unit, by 1. So we'd have negative 1, 0. We would have 0, 1. And we would have 3, comma 2. So that's the result of the square root function being shifted to the left one. So now we'd have something like this, right? OK, so that's what's happened there. But there is one more transformation to talk about, and that is the addition at the end. We did one of these already, right? What kind of shift was that? Vertical. So it's saying go up one unit. So if I want to draw this as going up one unit, that means my y values need to be adding 1 to them, right? So instead of negative 1, 0, I'm at negative 1, 1. Instead of 0, 1, I'm at 0, 2. And instead of 3, 2, I'm at 3, 3. And this should be the equation for y equals the square root of x plus 1 plus 1 outside. So let's look at our graph here. How does it look? At negative 1, we have an output of 1. At 0, we have an output of 2. And then at 3, 1, 2, 3, we have an output of 3 as well. 1, 2, 3. So this graph looks something like this. Does this make sense? Well, yeah, if you look at where we left off, we had shifted the graph to the left one, and now we've just moved it up one unit. OK. And we could talk about domain and range, of course. Well, in the last example we're going to look at now, instead of me giving you the equation, you're going to come up with it. Let's take a look. Oops, there it is. It says, sketch y equals x cubed, but after you've done each of the following, and then tell me the final equation. So they're telling you where to begin, so that's nice of them. So we begin with y equals x to the third power. What kind of graph was that? That was our snake. Now feel free to pause the video, of course, like always, and try it yourself. So if this was a snake, it looked something like this, right? And what were your three key points? That's right. You could input negative 1, and your output would be negative 1 to the third power, which is negative 1. You could input 0, and 0 cubed would be 0. You could input 1, and 1 cubed would be 1. So those were your three points that hopefully you've memorized for your snake. Negative 1, negative 1, 0, 0, and 1, 1. Now with those points, we are going to kind of track each of these transformations and maybe just graph one equation at the end, OK? So what we're going to look at next is this first transformation. We're going to go in order and apply them. The first thing that they ask us to do in this order is to reflect about the x-axis. So to flip over the x-axis, which signs have to change, your y or your x values? Your outputs are changing, aren't they, so the y values? So if I change the signs of my y values, that's your result in my output switching, so I'd have a flip over the x-axis. So your new points would have been, so your new points would have been negative 1, positive 1, 0, 0 is staying the way it is, and 1, negative 1. Okay, so that would have resulted 
in this sort of situation. Negative 1 would be at 1 now, 0 is still at 0, and 1 is now at negative 1. So that's showing that basic flip. Now you don't have to graph at each step, but I want to visually show you if you're a visual person what's going on. Now what would this equation have looked like, just so we can track with ourselves here? That's right, if you're changing the signs of the y values, you need to put the negative in front of the whole thing. So negative and then x cubed. Oops, there's my 3. So there's y equals negative sign in front, x to the third power. Okay, let's look at our second transformation here. Our second transformation is to take the graph that we just left off with and shift it to the right three units. Shifting it to the right three units. So let's see what that would mean here to shift this to the right three units. Normally what we would do here is we would go ahead and say to shift it to the right three means I pick up each of these points, right, and I walk them three units to the right. So that would affect my x value, wouldn't it? So for my new points here, instead of negative 1, 1, I'm adding 3 to my x value. And negative 1 plus 3 is 2, so I'd be at 2, 1. Instead of 0, 0, I'm adding 3 to my x value, so I'd have 3, 0. And instead of 1, negative 1, I'm adding 3 to my x value, so I'd have 4, negative 1. Now let's see how our equation would look and see if it's making sense, right? If we're really moving those three points to the right three units, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Our graph should look something like this now. Ooh, that's ugly. Something like this should be going on if we walked it over three units. So in the graph's equation, we had y equals negative out front and then our input cubed. Well, our negative out front needs to stay there, but how do we show it's been shifted to the right three? We'd use parentheses, good job. We'd still raise it to the third power, but in parentheses, what should I write? Good, x minus 3. That's indicating to the reader a shift to the right three units. And let's see if it makes sense if you plug in the point, for example, 2. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. Negative 1 to the third power is a negative 1. But then take the opposite and you get positive 1. And I encourage you to try this with all of your points to make sure that you're tracking with the right equation. There's one more transformation we need to do. So let's grab our color blue here. For our third transformation, we're supposed to shift the entire graph down two units. Visually, that means that each of these y values needs to go down two units. So down two units, this was at one. Something like this, something like this, something like this is happening. So this whole graph should be looking something like this at the end. And let's see if we can get that modeled with our points. Our y values need to change by subtracting two from them. So this becomes, instead of two, one, two, negative one. Instead of three, zero, 3, negative 2. And instead of 4, negative 1, 4, negative 3. Okay, so if we were to plot those, let's see what this looks like on our final graph. At 2, 1, 2, we have an output of negative 1. At 3, we have an output of negative 2. And at 4, we have an output of negative 3. So this is a snake that's looking something like this. And feel free to check Desmos to confirm that. How do I check Desmos? Well, I'd have to know what the equation is. Let's see what it would look like y equals negative x minus 3 in parentheses to the third power, and then what did we write at the end to indicate down to? Minus 2. Or f of x equals negative parentheses x minus 3 cubed minus 2. Always check to make sure it makes sense, right? Plug in your value for 2, let's say, and see if you get an output of negative 1. Again, 2 minus 3 is negative 1. Cubed, still negative 1. But then you take the opposite, positive 1. And 1 minus 2 is negative 1. So it's working for that point, and you can check the other points to make sure it's making sense. Again, once you have the actual graph as an equation, you can make predictions for any point along this trajectory. All right, so there are a couple things you're going to want to practice and get really good at. The first thing you want to look at is, do I know my basic functions, and do I understand what each of the changes in the equation tells me to do for transforming them? Secondly, can I graph the transformations myself? And third, can I actually create the function myself like this example? So you have a lot of practicing to do because math is definitely not a spectator sport. I'll see you next time.